Hey, welcome back to room 237. This is John. Coming at you with another video. This is another countdown video of probably my second favorite genre next to horror. Um, uh, this isn't going to be 25 again. This is just going to be my top 10 and some honorable mentions. Um, probably because horror I've been such a big fan of my whole life that I have so many favorites. The gangster genre, uh, this genre, haven't, I've been into it for quite a few years, but there just isn't, uh, I'm pretty specific on what I like, and that is of course, I almost slipped up anyway, so you probably already know, the crime, gangster, mob, mafia genre, I just, I love it, there's some of the best movies ever made, you get some of the best performances, best movies. Just a lot of people call them Oscar bait, but to me, I just think they're fantastic films. And so I have my top ten picked and some honorable mentions. I guess I'll do those first again. Uh, first honorable mention. I wasn't sure if this counted because it's not really mob or mafia or gangster. But it is a true story about a guy getting rich and living the high life in a very illegal way. Um, this is my favorite movie that the actor is in. It's one of my favorite Scorsese films. And that is, of course, The Wolf of Wall Street. I love this movie to death. I red boxed this like three times before I finally bought it. Yeah, it's... It's definitely a crime film because he is a criminal. He did owe, like, the real Jordan Belfort owed, like, $110 million in restitution after everything was said and done. This movie's three hours long, but, you know, after watching movies like this for so long, um, three hour movies feel like nothing to me. Like, I, I can watch a movie no matter how long it is. And, um, let's see if I can fix this here real quick. That's a little far, kind of bothering me. There we go. But yeah, this is my favorite uh, DiCaprio film. Yeah, so three hours, three hours is nothing for me. Basically, you know, for those that don't know, he started at a firm in Wall Street. He got a taste of money, drugs, and women. His firm, I'm all stuffy again. His firm went under, so he started his own. And he started this scam where he was selling, uh, what was it? Like, blue chip stocks at penny stock prices or something, something like that. He goes into depth with it, but I always forget. And it's pretty much just, you know, how on top of the world he lived. It's skeptical as to how much of it is true because it's based on his book. This movie holds the record for most instances of the word fuck in any scripted movie. I always thought it was a uh, gutter balls, but that movie's awful and stupid. This is one of those great Scorsese movies where, you know, it has great acting. A very extensive soundtrack. There's only like 60 songs in this movie. Jonah Hill. This is a movie that proved that Jonah Hill can actually act. He was nominated for an Oscar in this. <coughs> this movie's just... Uh, also, this was the first movie I ever saw Margot Robbie in. Who would go on to become Harley Quinn. Just, there's so much greatness about this movie. And... If anybody knows anything about Scorsese, it's that he allows complete liberal use of improvised profanity. So that's why there's so many fucks and shits and everything in this movie. Tons of nudity, tons of drugs. Like, he let everything fly in this movie. But of course, that's not why I like it. I actually think it's a good movie. Um, it's not for everybody. This isn't the kind of movie you want to watch with your family which is weird because it was released on Christmas but I I really love this movie every once in a like it's three hours long so I mean you can kill an afternoon watching this 
But anyway, honorable mention. I shouldn't spend too much time on it. We have Public Enemies, where Johnny Depp plays John Dillinger, the bank robber. You also have Christian Bale as FBI agent. Uh... It doesn't even say on the back of it. Oh, uh, a Melvin Purvis as an FBI agent, Melvin Purvis. This is a great movie, it's a great action movie. Directed by Michael Mann, who also did Heat, which I'm not a big action guy, but that's a good action heist movie. Johnny Depp is great in this. Now this isn't really Italian mafia gang, but it's still a gang movie. Another Scorsese DiCaprio film, Gangs of New York. But this also has Daniel Day-Lewis, who steals the movie. Daniel Day-Lewis is great. You know, it takes place in sometime in the 1800s. Like, it's right before the Civil War. But, you know, DiCaprio's dad gets killed by Day-Lewis in a gang fight between the natives, the New Yorkers, and the Irish. DiCaprio then spends his life growing up, wanting revenge, then he goes under Day Lewis's wing, plots his revenge, and then, you know, eventually everything comes to a head. This movie is long also. Um it's close to three hours. It feels longer, it's slower paced, but I still like it. A Bronx Tale. Actually directed by Robert De Niro, who's my favorite actor. This was the first movie he directed. He's not in it very much. But, you know, he plays a guy that drives the city bus. And his son... I can't remember what else his son is in when he's young, but... If you've seen any movie in the early 90s with the kid, you've seen him. His his son is, you know, really admires the local mob boss, played by Chaz Palminteri, based on his play that he wrote. So, like, De Niro wants to teach him how to work for your money. This guy wants to take his son under his wing, teach him how to be a gangster. There's a lot of racial tension. There's a lot of, you know, what's better, family, like, blood family or mafia family values. It, it, it's a pretty good movie. Again, this one, it's not really a gangster movie. There's gangster stuff in it, but it is a criminal, and that is Blow, another movie with Johnny Depp. Plays George Young, who was pretty much the biggest cocaine distributor in the 70s and 80s. He actually just got out of jail. This, the ending is extremely depressing, but I still think it's a very good movie. Donnie Brasco, yeah, Johnny Depp again. Most of my Johnny Depp movies are gangster flicks. Whenever he plays a real-life gangster or criminal, he does phenomenally. This is a true story. He plays a guy who goes undercover named Donnie Brasco. He meets uh, this aging... Uh, this aging gangster played by Al Pacino. His name's Lefty. Lefty kind of takes him under his wing and... He just gets deeper and deeper into the gangster life, and he can't get his way out. It's pretty good. And then lastly, I figured to throw a comedy in there. There is one comedy that I like that I think is funnier than this, but I plan on doing a top 10 favorite comedy video also. And this is a Harold Ramis film, May He Rest in Peace, the, the legend Harold Ramis. Let us analyze this. You know, Robert De Niro's a mob boss who's finally suffering all the anxieties of his life. Billy Crystal is Billy Crystal, family therapist that he will not stop harassing to make him better. 
I also have analyzed that, but that's when it got really goofy and silly. This, I still think, is just good, smart comedy. So those are my honorable mentions. Uh, I wish I, my nose could clear up so I don't sound as goofy like I do in all my other videos. Anyway, <clears throat> some of these I'm going to spend more time on than others, obviously. At number 10, we have Carlito's Way. It's another Al Pacino movie. Al Pacino's my third favorite actor. I would say Robert De Niro, Christian Bale, and Al Pacino. Did I say that right? Robert De Niro, Christian Bale, and Al Pacino. Sorry. Those are my top three favorite actors. Sean Penn is also great in this movie. This is filmed by Brian De Palma, who is known for great gangster flicks and great uh, suspense films and thrillers. Pretty much... Uh, Pacino plays a Puerto Rican by the name of uh, Carlito, Carlito Brigante. He's a guy, he was like this huge-ass gangster. He got caught. He went away for some time. He came out. He wants to go straight. He wants to make enough money to where he can just leave the city forever and start a new life. Yeah, so right there for the director of Scarface. But, of course, the, the pressures and the reputation and everything just keeps bringing him in. Of course, Sean Penn. Sean Penn's kind of a scene stealer in this. If you've ever played Grand Theft Auto Vice City, and you remember your lawyer, Ken, the guy with the pink suit and the fro, that is Sean Penn in this movie. He's just a, a crooked lawyer who keeps who won't stop using coke and he just keeps getting paranoid more paranoid more, more paranoid uh pacino is great he you really feel like he's a guy that just wants to say fuck this life i want to go straight and it just keeps pulling him back in so that's number 10 number nine i actually saw the theaters and it's my favorite movie with this actor this is who i think is the best or In this movie, I think he does the best. Excuse me. Johnny Depp in Black Mass. I waited forever to see this in theaters. And of course, this is the story of Whitey Bulger. You know, growing up in Maine, of course, I know who Whitey Bulger is. The kingpin of Southie, South Boston. The Sugar Hill Gang in the 1970s. This is more so about his alliance with the FBI. As an informant, great performances, the accents are not that bad, and Johnny Depp is unrecognizable as Whitey Bulger in this. Just a really fantastic movie. I, I was not disappointed when I saw this in theaters. So that's number nine. Yeah, guys, sorry about sounding all stuffy. <clears throat> um, at number eight... Again, I'm not sure if this counts, but this is such a brilliant movie that I I had to throw it in because there is mob stuff in it. That is American Hustle. You know, hell of a cast. You got Christian Bale, Jeremy Renner, Brad Bradley Cooper, Amy Adams, Jennifer Lawrence. I actually didn't know him, but Robert De Niro does make an appearance in this. You know, Christian Bale is a con artist. <clears throat> well, first, some of this is true. A lot of it's fabricated. But this is this movie is what's called a period piece. It takes place at a certain time. And they do everything they can to make it feel like it's in that time. The opening credits, when they're showing the distribution company logos, they actually take the logos from the 70s. And, like... The font of the credits is all in 70s. They did a fantastic job at making this feel like it's 1970s. Uh, Christian Bale, he's a con artist. He's one of the best. He's married to Jennifer Lawrence, who does a great performance, but I hate her character. Still great performance, but her character pisses me off. But then he meets Amy Adams. 
who's sort of enthralled by how great of a con artist he is, they start a romantic and professional relationship. They get caught by the feds, Bradley Cooper. He says, I'll let you go if you help me take down four corrupt politicians. So the whole movie is how are they going to screw over these politicians except for Jeremy Renner, who's actually an honest politician. And then the mob gets involved and everything gets all frigged up. And, you know, the whole movie is about, you know, who's playing who. It's This is another movie I read box three times before I bought it. I love American Hustle. Number seven, I gotta be careful with this because this is old and it's falling apart. And kind of like when I did my top horror, this is one I probably don't need to go into much detail with, but number seven is Scarface. I have this wonderful special edition. You'll let you take that part out there was a money clip in here but I don't know what happened to it it does come with the original 1930s film bunch of little things that I haven't opened yet but yeah Scarface of course Al Pacino actually here I'll just do this this will be easier Cuban immigrant. This this is the best rags to riches, rise and fall stories. He of course plays Tony Montana. Comes over comes over on on a banana boat. Sorry, I can't do it when I'm stuffed up. But you know he comes over during the immigration in the early '80s. Him and his partner Manny. You know they start working for this guy. They start making some money. There's some betrayal. He comes on top. And of course, pretty much how someone can crumble under their own excess. Just guns, violence, betrayal, and cocaine. It's a great movie. I remember the first, t first time I saw this, it was on cable, which is never okay to watch a movie like this. But I mean, Scarface. What more do I got to say about that? That's number seven. <clears throat> number six we have another Scorsese film because Scorsese is the man of these kind of movies and that is The Departed again another movie he did with Leo DiCaprio and Scorsese isn't really known for doing ensemble casts but I mean you have Leo DiCaprio, Matt Damon, Jack Nicholson Mark Wahlberg Martin Sheen, uh, Alec Baldwin. This is a great movie. This is simple. This is somewhat based on the Whitey Bulger story, but pretty much just you know, the Jack Nicholson Frank Costello character is somewhat based on Whitey Bulger. But basically, you know, you have Matt Damon, who was taken under the wing of him as a child. So he's part of the mob, but he gets put through the police academy, becomes a detective so he can be, you know, the mole for him. He actually comes from a mafia family, doesn't want anything to do with it. He wants to be a cop. Of course, the police department doesn't really believe him, so the undercover department Makes him go undercover to work in his mob, you know, to find out stuff about him. So you have two rats who are un pretty much undercover in each other's world. And I think that is very smart. It's very good. This is actually the movie that got me really into DiCaprio. Because for the longest time I thought he was just like this titanic pretty boy. But then I saw Wolf of Wall Street. I was like, okay, this is actually pretty good. Yeah, this came out in 2006, and I didn't see it till like 2014. I'm too busy watching other stuff. But yeah, uh, this is the one that made me say, okay, DiCaprio can act. 
This is also probably the only movie, pro pro well, probably the best movie, that does the Boston accent perfectly. Except, there are some lines that are cringy, like Jack Nicholson can't really do it. And I know Mark Wahlberg and Matt Damon are from the area. But like, if you ever want to see a movie where someone says something perfectly, go to the end where Matt Damon calls DiCaprio a cocksucker. That's how you use a Boston accent in a movie. But again, this movie is intense. It's very well written, greatly acted. It is about two and a, it is two and a half hours long, but you gotta expect that with a crime movie at this point. This movie's just, and this is the only movie that Scorsese won um, best best director for. So there's that. So six. So at number five. Five. We have the longest movie in my collection. Once upon a time in America. This is three and three quarter hours. This is not the longest version you can get. There's a Blu-ray that's like a half hour longer. This is actually what's called a. Uh, Spaghetti crime film or spaghetti Western or it's not a Western Spaghetti mob film because it's made by an Italian filmmaker <laughs> This takes place over 50 years. There's a time period 1921 33 and 68 And it follows this group of friends This group of pretty much four boys Two of which is Robert De Niro, and the other one's James Woods. You see them, you see their characters as children, but then in 33 and 68, they're adults. And I, I can't talk about the plot to this too much because it's way too long and way too much happens. But this is one of the most depressing, sad, like, just bummer movies because of all the betrayal and greed and lust and just terrible things but you know it feels like a 1930s movie the whole like last hour or so is really depressing like especially for Robert De Niro's character you feel really bad for him towards the end when you realize what could have been with his life I mean it, this is one of the most criminally underseen movies of all time. It's ranked as one of the best movies of the 80s, best gangster movies, best crime films. I've only met one other person that's even heard of this, and that's because I loaned it to that person. Basically, to sum it up, uh, De Niro, back in the 30s, he ratted out on his friends. They all got killed. You find this out at the beginning of the movie. He had to live in hiding for 35 years. And then all of a sudden, you know, he gets a call. He gets a letter saying to come back to New York. He thinks it's people coming after him again. He thinks they found him. That's when he reminisces the whole movie. And then towards the end, you know, you find out it, in a way it was all for nothing. Some things didn't go as planned. Or was it the way that he thought it happened? And the way the music is, the way it's acted, it's very depressing, very sad. Be forewarned, though, there is a rape scene in this with Robert De Niro. And I mean, there's rape scenes in Last House on the Left, Spin on Your Grave, Hills Have Eyes. But this is different. I mean, in a horror movie, yeah, it's horrific, but when it's in a movie like this, I mean, it's very realistic and raw, and it just, it's a scene that doesn't end, it's just, it, I, I guess what I want to say is it's more horrific, it feels war, more realistic than what's in a horror movie, and, but when you watch that scene, 
And then afterwards, you see how De Niro port portrays. You are on a roller coaster of emotions. And if I ever do a review for this film, I'll go into what I mean. It's a powerful movie. And again, because of its time, I don't watch it that much. But I do really, really love Once Upon a Time in America. Number four. We have another Scorsese. That is Casino. Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci. Which is my favorite on-screen duo. <clears throat> Another three-hour-long movie. Basically, De Niro is... It takes place you know, between early 70s and early 80s. De Niro is given this casino resort in Vegas to run. With Joe Pesci as kind of like a guy to make... As a maid guy in the mob to make sure everything goes smoothly then De Niro meets Sharon Stone and everything gets all fucked up that's why I like the tagline no one stays at, top, at the top forever that's true I mean the the opening sequence and the ending sequence with that um, if you look it up the title translates to uh, Matthew's Passion it's an old uh uh a biblical choir piece of music it really makes it feel like like an epic almost Shakespearean kind of uh, tragedy it doesn't quite live up to it but it's still a very good movie I consider this a sister film to something else that's further up on this list but you know it has all the tropes of a Scorsese film great act I was gonna say great acting this is the last move, like, De Niro, there are some scenes where he's really good, then other scenes where it looks like he's kind of bored. <clears throat> it seems like the other movie that I'm talking about, whatever worked in that one, it's like, let's just kick it up to 11 for this one. Uh, the soundtrack, not all the songs work, but I know, this is number four on my list, and I'm talking shit about it. I do love this movie. I do think this is a fantastic movie. Just compared to the other one, it, it is kind of inferior. But I don't know, yeah, whatever. Casino, great movie. Then at number three, this is probably going to surprise a lot of people. Number three is The Godfather. Part one to my favorite trilogy of all time. I love the mythology behind it. The whole world the trilogy is built. And this is the first one, of course. You know, Marlon Brando as Vito Corleone. On the back, you have all the Corleone boys. You know, it opens up with the I Believe in America speech. Opens up with the it's the day of his daughter's wedding. Uh, this is the movie that skyrocketed Al Pacino. Al Pacino is the youngest of the Corleones. He doesn't want anything to do with the family business. Someone puts a hit on his life. They fail. Pacino takes it upon himself to do something about it. And then, you know, there's a course of more events, and he, that's when Pacino decides to take over. Pacino actually has more screen time than Marlon Brando, which is why Pacino tried to boycott the Oscars. Because he was nominated for supporting actor, Brando was best actor. This movie is just, like, this movie's like watching art. This is like watching fine, beautiful art. And the first time I saw it, I was just in a trance. I did not realize three hours had gone by. It is just a beautiful film. So much so that at number two, we have the greatest sequel of all time, Godfather Part Two. By now, Al Pacino is Michael. He is, you know... Uh, in full reign, full control of the family. He's desperately trying to make the family go legitimate and get him away from crime. 
But he is such a relentless evil bastard throughout this movie. He does some evil shit. You know, I don't mean it like a Hannibal Lecter, you know, horror movie evil. I mean like what people can do. What people who don't want to give up power do. Note it. He's often described as either a tragic hero or a great villain. I think he's a little bit of both. You get some great scenes like that scene there with De Niro. I don't know how you can see that. De Niro standing there with a towel wrapped around his arm with the pistol while he's going after the black hand. That's probably my favorite scene in the whole movie. Pretty much someone puts a hit on Michael and his family's life and then he spends the whole movie trying to figure out you know, who the traitor in the family is. All the while, this is a sequel and a prequel. Because every once in a while we'll go back in time to how the original Godfather got started when he was younger. Played by Robert De Niro. And all of Robert De Niro's lines are in uh, Sicilian. He speaks Sicilian to, to every line he does, except for I'll make him an offer he can't refuse. He does say that line. But he also, he also does the Marlon Brando. He does that while speaking Italian. But the parallels is that Vito, played by De Niro, He's humble, and that's how he can make his family grow, and how he can gain respect. Michael is just relentless and power-hungry, and that's why everything around him falls apart. Probably the most evil, perfect example of just how much of a relentless bastard he is, is when he has to go to the Supreme Court because one of his guys is scared of him. And if you've seen this, you know what I'm talking about. Michael brings the guy's brother in into the courtroom he just looks at the guy like you say anything you know your brother's dead he doesn't even have to say anything it's just the look he gives him <clears throat> um, this is one of really two movies that every time I see the betrayal I'm not going to spoil who the family member that put the hit on him is but every, one of two movies that whenever I see the betrayal in it, like, it's hard to watch. It's like, I get upset, and I, it's like, I want it to be over. And that is this, and the other one is Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. As silly as it sounds, but there's actually a lot of parallels between the Godfather trilogy and at least the first two new apes movies. I said that this movie was like watching fine art. This movie's just that much better. And this is a half hour longer. This is three and a half hours. But this is still just a beautiful, wonderful, excellent, engrossing, fantastic movie. This is the greatest sequel ever made, in my opinion. And it is better than the original Godfather, I think. I absolutely love Godfather 2. And lastly, at number one, what could I possibly have above the two first two Godfather films? Number one is Goodfellas. I love Goodfellas to death. I used to have a DVD where I used to have to flip the disc. Now I just now I had to get the Blu rays as features. It's all on one side. This is the what I consider the sister film to Casino, because you know it. It's the screenplay was co-written by Nicholas Pileggi, Martin Scorsese. There's a book about it, about the true story by Nicholas Pileggi, directed by Scorsese. It stars De Niro and Pesci. There's a smaller role by Frank Vincent who plays Billy Bats in this. This movie is perfect in every way. <clears throat> I, I should have said this movie is perfect because this movie is perfect. This is the perfect movie. But 
and I know The Shining I said was my number one favorite movie but to me this is still perfect I happen to like this one even more how Ray Liotta did not get an Oscar nomination for Best Actor is beyond me. I love Robert De Niro in it. Joe Pesci is absolutely fantastic. He deserved his Best Supporting Actor for it. There really is no plot to this. This doesn't have the original tagline, which is, you know, 30 years of life in the mob. It... It just, it takes place from, you know, 55 to 85. Follow, you see Ray Liotta as like a young teenage kid. All the way up until 1985, till 30 years later. And the thing about Scorsese is when he does the movie, whenever the movie takes place, he will not use music that came up um, after that. Like, whenever a movie takes place, if he's going to use music, it has to be time appropriate. So as time goes on in this, so does the soundtrack. Like, we get music from the 50s all the way up to the 80s. It's sort of, the way the mob life changes, so does the music. Like, in the 50s, when everything is great and wonderful, and it's all these big Italian guys, you get this 50s Italian music. Then in the 70s, when it's like these guys, and it starts to kind of go to hell. It's like American rock music. And you get some of the most beautiful shots I've ever seen in a movie. For example, when uh, Ray Liotta as Henry, first time him and Karen go on a real date, and he takes her to the Copacabana, but he takes her through the back entrance. And... The camera is on them the whole it's one one shot, one tracking shot as they go through all the hallways, up all the stairs, while the song And Then He Kissed Me by the Crystals. First time I saw that I was like, How did he do that? And also like when they get to certain points in the hallway or the kitchen or anything, it's supposed to be certain cues to the song that's playing. I was like, how'd they do that? That's beautiful. There's also another character named Maury, who is a thorn in Robert De Niro's ass the entire time. It's the part where De Niro is finally thinking about killing him, and Maury is walking out of the room, and De Niro's sitting at the bar just giving him this look. He's puffing on a cigarette while the opening to Sunshine of Your Love plays. Just as he's kind of... It almost looks slow motion, but it's not. It's just how Robert De Niro's doing it. That looks fantastic. Also, the way Scorsese makes everybody age. Like, you don't really notice it, but by the end of the movie, like, De Niro's got big glasses, and he's gray, and Polly has all white hair. It's very slow and methodical, like... You kind of just go with it. Then by the end of the movie, would you notice how old everybody is? Um, you know, great violence. Like, the I consider violence in this to be more violent than, like, a Saw movie. Because that's just gory. There's a difference between gore and violence. Go watch the scene in this. When Henry goes after the guy that was messing with Karen, and he pistol whips him about a dozen times. Tell me how you feel after watching that. You don't see much blood. There is blood, and all you do is hear the metal against the bone. But, like, you watch that, and it's way more realistic and visceral and raw than, in, like, a Saw movie. Like, oh, really? fuck is it really just like cheaters justice in this with the hammer in the hand or with the bats in the uh cornfield these two movies have way more visceral violence than what's in a horror movie gangster movies have unreal violence more effective violence i guess 
But yeah, this is by far my favorite gangster movie. This is everything I look for. This also changed the way people look at gangster movies because... You look at movies like this. It shows what it's like to be on top. It almost glamorizes it. Like, you're living like a god or like a king. These are the guys on the street. These are the guys getting their hands dirty. These are guys being criminals. And also, this movie pretty much tells you that nobody lives like the Godfather forever. There's even a line in this where it says, you know, there... There's only three ways that you can end up after life of the mob. And that is dead, hiding, or in jail. And that is true. And I guess the historical accuracy in this is very spot on. Because the real Henry Hill, Ray Liotta's character, was consulted quite a bit for this. And uh, I've seen this movie dozens of times. It's like... It's over two and a half hours, but I, I love it. This is a movie I saw on cable too. I've seen a lot of movies on cable I shouldn't have, but of all the movies I saw on cable, it was like, oh yeah, that's pretty good. I should pick that up someday. This one I was actually engrossed by. Even on cable, this was still a fantastic experience. And Goodfellas. It's one of my favorite movies of all time, regardless of genre. It is just a fantastic movie. And also, if you're a gangster, you don't have to worry about going to jail because the jail scene in this is just like, wow, those guys don't have to worry about a thing. So yeah, Goodfellas, number one, perfect movie. So yeah, sorry I sounded all stuffed up that whole time, but... Uh, those are my top 10 favorite gangster, mobster, mafia movies. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you want to check some of them out. But uh, I got to go blow my nose. So uh, for Room 237, John's out. Thank you.